And string theory is obviously a major breakthrough, at least theoretically, in physics. And I'd like to try to understand it. And when I start looking at it, I see many different string theories. Uh, there was M theory and then five and then then in a different sense, each one can have 10 to the 500th different uh, for, ge, topological geometric uh, formulation. So help, help me understand how to appreciate all these different kinds or numbers of string theories. <clears throat> so by the early 80s, hmm. through the work of colleagues such as John Schwartz and Michael Green, it was possible to make a consistent theory of quantum gravity unified with elementary particles in string theory, the holy but, grail. <laughs> but it wasn't realistic. There were basic aspects of elementary particles as we see them in the real world that weren't reproduced successfully. The most dramatic of those, extremely familiar to physicists and probably less so to your viewers, was the handedness of the weak interactions. The weak interactions were an important part of the nuclear mm. f physics, and the particles that come out in nuclear beta decays spin in a definite way, never backwards. Mm. And that's a very basic property of the world as we understand it, and a rather strange one. And it was impossible to reproduce that in string theory. Mm. So we went through a period where there were models, consistent models of quantum gravity unified with something, but the something didn't look like real elementary particles. In the mid-80s, there was a succession of additional breakthroughs. One result was that it became possible to make models that did capture the rough properties of elementary particles in a realistic way, including the handedness mm -hmm. of the daughter particles in beta decay. And the knowledge of string theory was greatly enriched, such that we understood with the level of understanding of the mid-80s that there were five consistent string theories, of which one looked like a reasonable draft of the real world. That was when you the, say five consistent, when you say consistent, that means each of the, there's no internal contradictions? Yes, consistent means no internal contradictions. So. What were the differences between them that you can describe? So in the understanding of the mid-80s, there were five string theories. So in two of them, strings were closed loops, uh -huh. but moreover were superconductors. Uh -huh. So a string was a little loop of superconductor. Uh -huh. In two string theories, the strings were closed loop, but they were insulators. <laughs> and in the fifth string theory, strings existed as either closed loops, which were again insulators, or else open strings with electric charges at their ends. So at least that's a cartoon version of the five string theories in the understanding of the 80s. Okay. So as we understood it in the mid 80s, uh, we could make a reasonable model of at least a rough draft of elementary particles unified with quantum mechanics and gravity through string theory. But there was a puzzle. If one of those five string theories describes our universe, who lives in the other four worlds? <laughs> because they're all consistent. They were all consistent. Yeah. And, and they were all moreover different by the understanding of the time. Mm -hmm. So in the following decade, the understanding changed. And by the mid-90s, we understood that there really are, is only one string theory. So the five different string theories are different aspects of the same thing, studied in different approximations. Mm. So in an interesting physical theory, you never solve the equations exactly. Systems that you can solve exactly are unrealistically simple to describe the real world. Mm. So. Um, you make some assumptions about the parameters and you find an approximate solution. So here there's Planck's constant, which controls quantum effects, and there's a stringy parameter, somewhat like Planck's constant. It's called alpha prime, or the string slope. Yeah. So in different regions of this parameter space, well, the modern understanding is that there's one string theory which was studied in five different regions of its parameter space to give birth to the five traditional string theories. Okay, so that's looking backwards, that, that, that the five that looked like they were competing or independent, yes. now then it was, and you had a role, of course, in that and showing that the same. Now, the term M theory, we all hear that. And we, everybody wonders whether M means uh, mystical, magical. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I used to say that M stood for magic, mystery, or matrix, according to taste. But what I really had in mind was that I had colleagues who thought it should be understood as a membrane theory. Oh. I was skeptical, but... So I didn't call it membrane theory, <laughs> but I didn't want to contradict them either. So I said it was M theory, where M stands for magic mystery or membrane, and time would tell. <laughs> a couple of years later, the membranes were derived from matrices. And by coincidence, the word matrix also starts with the letter M. So for a while, I used to say it was magic mystery or matrix. But really, M was for membrane. It was just a question. Uh -huh. 
of whether membranes are one facet of the theory, which I think is what most people believe, or the whole theory should be derived from membranes, which yeah, was a competing view. How would it be membrane? Is, what is a string relative to a membrane? Because uh, a string is one dimensional. Yeah, so how does it a membrane, Membranes, in this sense, were supposed to be two-dimensional surfaces. Oh, OK. But the, so anyway, the term M theory is really used in two senses. So we now understand that there's an overarching theory that has the five traditional string theories as limiting cases. And that theory is often called M theory. Okay. But it turns out that in addition to the five traditional string theories, there's a sixth limit that's also important in understanding the theory. It's 11-dimensional instead of 10-dimensional. Oh. And sometimes people refer to that limit as M theory. Oh, so unfortunately, so the nomenclature is very the confusing. The nomenclature is confused. Two terms, two new terms were needed, and only one was coined. <laughs> so, as, as if you needed more complexity in string theory. <laughs> well, we did need another term to avoid confusion. But usually, you can tell from the context what someone has in mind. Right. Now, now those other theories that are that are the uh, limiting cases of the one theory. Yes. Uh, only one of them describe our universe? Well, uh, the idea would be that our universe is described, by, roughly speaking, by one solution of this big theory. Right. So there's only one theory, but it has many solutions. The solution, first of all, your viewers might not completely know what I mean by a solution, but roughly speaking, there are some equations and you solve them. And from this point of view, a universe is represented by a solution of the equations. It's actually more complicated than that. A solution is an approximation to a quantum state, which is what really describes the universe. Uh, uh, uh. But anyway, the idea would be that um, there's one theory, but what the universe actually looks like depends upon which solutions of the equation is appropriate for describing Okay, so let's talk about the number of solutions, because we, we hear this term banning about 10 to the 500. That's 10 with 500 zeros, which is a number we don't, uh, don't even have a name for. So, uh, which is well, hugely more than the number of particles in the universe, et cetera. So, and that has to do with the geometric shapes. So, uh, first of all, the standard model of particle physics is a little bit complicated, actually. The ideas are simple, but um, the implementation that we see in the real world is a little complicated with a lot of bits and pieces. And the only reason that something simple, as simple as string theory, can reproduce the complexity of the standard model is that there are extra dimensions. Mm -hmm. And the topological complexity of the extra dimensions generates the details of the standard model. Okay. So the theory really would not work without the complexity of the extra dimensions. But the complexity of the extra dimensions turns out to be such that there are vast, vast numbers of possibilities to the best of our present understanding for what form the extra dimensions might take. And these are topological, uh, structural? Well, a very large part of it is topological. Let's think of it as topological. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make an analogy, however. Einstein's theory is one theory, but it doesn't predict the details of the solar system. To wow. get the solar system, you need to know the masses and composition, really, of sure. the planets and the sure. sun and the asteroids. Sure. And you also need to know the initial conditions. Sure. So nobody really asks Einstein's theory to predict exactly what the solar system would look like. <laughs> we only use Einstein's theory to predict how the solar system will evolve, given what we observe as the initial conditions. Because we understand that the solar system depends on the initial conditions. And by now, we've been able to take, make observations of distant solar systems. So we know there are different solar systems out there. And you couldn't really, I mean, without feeding in the fact that we're in this particular one, you wouldn't know which solution of Einstein's equations you wanted to take. Now, the traditional view of physicists is not to think of the whole universe in that way. So Einstein insisted very much that there should be a unique answer determined right. only on logical grounds right. for all dimensionless numbers that you measure in nature. Mm -hmm. Now, again, your viewers might not know what I mean by dimensionless number. Some things you measure depend on the units where you measure them. Like, it takes a year for the Earth to go around the sun. That's not a very interesting number because it just depends on how we define the year. <laughs> now, a more interesting number is that it takes about twice as long for Mars to go around the sun as the Earth. And that does not depend on the units in which we measure time. Mm -hmm. There's a factor of two between the period of the orbit of Mars and the one of the Earth. Mm -hmm. That's a dimensionless number. Mm -hmm. But it's a dimensionless number that depends on the solar system and would be different in a different solar system. To get something a little more interesting, we might take 
the ratio of the electron mass to the proton mass. Either mass by itself, as a number, depends on the units in which we measure mass. But the ratio of the electron to the proton mass Fixed. is one of those dimensionless numbers for which Einstein said there should be a completely unique answer. Mm. Einstein imagined that the universe should be described by a unique system of equations that would have a unique answer mm. for all observable dimensionless quantities. Now, what we have in string theory with the present understanding is a unique system of equations, but it's not close to having a unique answer, with our present understanding mm. at least. Mm. We're not absolutely sure that our present understanding is definitive, but the best understanding we have now does not point to a unique answer. So it points to something a little bit more like the solar system. Einstein's theory is unique, but it had many solutions. Mm. And the uh, cottage industry that has grown up uh, criticizing string theory for its lack of verifiability and that in order to uh, uh, achieve the energies needed to, to test it experimentally, you need an accelerator the size of the Milky Way. Uh, what, what are your responses to those uh, critiques? Well, string theory is certainly not a well-established theory. It's not like the standard model of particle physics or like Einstein's theory of gravity. String theory is the framework in which humans have been able to imagine how quantum mechanics and gravity can work together consistently. It's a long-term speculative enterprise. We only understand aspects of it even after decades of work. Personally, I think that having discovered how quantum mechanics and gravity can work together consistently, it's our duty to explore it more. If string theory had not been discovered, I personally think that I would not have tried to discover something like it because I would have had no idea where to begin in reconciling quantum mechanics and gravity. But it's kind of unnatural uh, to ignore the fact that there's an extremely rich theory that people actually have discovered that can make this work. And it doesn't just make it possible for gravity and quantum mechanics to work together, but it forces them upon you. If you <clears throat> start trying to use string theory to describe a quantum theory that you think maybe doesn't have gravity, Gravity is literally forced upon you because of the way it pops out of the equations. So it's extremely unnatural not to notice this and not to take it seriously. That doesn't mean it should be everybody's cup of tea or that everybody should work on it. With that said, though, I've noticed that, generally speaking, the critics don't seem to try very hard to work on a competing theory or to suggest one.